Lecture 20 of ECE 2305. Okay, so that, so we're already pretty deep into the course. And today we're going to be continuing about the network layer, which I'll draw in a few minutes. And uh, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be continuing our discussion about IP, and in particular, DHCP, NAT, and ICMP. We'll then talk about this thing called IPv6, which you might see when you're setting up a Windows uh, network or a, a Mac network or anything like that. So I'll explain a little bit about the motivation behind IPv6. Okay. So actually, let's, let's go back to our diagram that I drew last class. Okay. So last class, we had the following diagram, right? And this is, again, our protocol architecture. Yeah, architecture. So we have the application layer, app layer. And remember that there are ports. And then we have the transport layer. And then we had the network access layer. And then that network access layer is connected to some communications network, comms network. And then in turn, we that let's say that's computer A. That's computer B. Right? And that's application layer. That's transport layer, network access layer. And then let's say we have, again, another computer here. Let's say this has three ports. Application layer, transport layer, network, uh, uh, network access layer. And so uh, what we saw last class was sort of this idea that in this network access layer, at this boundary, we have transport layer, right? And we have this network layer, right? So this is where our IP address and everything resides, like, right? So what we wanted to, what we did last class is we saw how we have the IP datagrams with the, you know, the IP addresses and the headers and, and the like. So we have, at this stage here, we have the IP datagrams. And how there's this conversion process, conversion, between the different layers, right? We use, let's say, the header information in this IP datagram, and we s progressively encapsulate with more and more information as we move down from application layer, translates through these ports to transport layer, to transport layer, we then wrap that up into like what we have an IP datagram, we progressively add on, add on, add on all this additional information before we send it over the network to its desired destination. And then we do the reverse, we remove this packaging. So the equivalent would be, unfortunately, this kind of gives me like, you know, sort of like this sad feeling in my stomach, like, you know, one of those, um, you know, PBS kid shows many, many years ago, I was a sensitive kid. And what happens is, like, there was this episode on waste, you know, and un environmentally unfriendly um, practices and stuff. And it's like, suppose you want this toy, you know, this ball or this doll or something. And then it was wrapped in plastic. And then it was covered in a box. And then it was covered in wrapping paper. And then you tear all this stuff. And then the, the, the you know, the, the sort of aha moment was this big pile of paper and plastic and more paper and corrugated of, um, cardboard. And all you really wanted was the doll, right? <coughs> Except that here, <laughs> the difference is the wrapping here is, first of all, not paper. So environmentally, should be a little bit more sound. Although, although there is actually a growing area in the communications world, and for those people that think of green energy, with respect to communication networks, 
So I'll get back to that in a moment. Actually, no, I'll talk about it now. So for instance, like let's say you have those communication networks, right? And no data is flowing on them, but there's still power on all those fiber optics and wireless devices out there, right? So what happens is, because we don't know when someone's going to need access to that network at any given time. And then you wonder, how much energy does this consume? And the answer is an awful lot. Partly by the network, more importantly, by the cooling systems that you need to cool those guys down. So if you see Bob Brown, so if you go and see my father-in-law, and you know, he'll love this, ask him, hey, can, can you show me the ECE server room? If he's not busy, he'll say, oh, come on. And like, you know, he'll show you this server from 2003. He'll show you the two mini split air conditioners that they installed in that server room downstairs, right next to robotics in the dean of engineering's office, right? It turns out that a good chunk of energy is consumed in cooling, right? If you go to a server farm, like there's one at Gateway Park, and they just recently built this server farm. They installed, I think, these two massive, um, I'm not sure if it's a chiller, but it's definitely some massive air conditioning unit to, to cool everything down. If any of you live, yes? I've heard that they're moving a lot of, a lot of server companies are moving like to Alaska, and because land is cheap and they're cold. Yeah. Exactly. That or um, what some folks do is like there was this talk of having server farms on barges and you put them into the cold ocean and you take cold ocean water, you pull from below and then you uh, chill or you keep cool and you send back down, right? Yeah. But, okay, but that is environmentally unfriendly that option, because what happens is you have something called thermal pollution. Fish don't like it when they've got hot water and they're swimming in it. That's why if any of you go to Fall River, I'm just full of antidotes today, but seriously, if you go to Fall River, you'll see these two humongous smokestacks that, or like cooling towers that you'd normally see in nuclear power plants. But no, this is a coal burning <coughs> power plant, and the reason is is that for the longest time they were like taking cool water out of Mount Hope Bay cooling off the cold burning power plant and then dumping it back. And that, they found, was very bad for the fishies. So they built these two humongous things. And so when my wife was doing her graduate studies, I would open her window and I see two huge cooling towers, each one 500 feet tall. And I'm like saying, I hope that's not a nuclear power plant. So cooling is, is huge. If you live across from a telecommunication center, so I lived for five years in downtown Worcester, across from the Verizon head office, where they have all their switches and all their telecom. And you always wonder on some days, you'll just see these big plumes of moisture coming out. They're cooling everything. So cooling costs a lot of money in terms, and a lot of energy. So now, I digress. <laughs> so going back to this. So what happens is in this case, we have those wrappers because each layer performs a specific function. So we are adding a little bit of energy every time to this network, but we're doing so with the purpose of ultimately and reliably getting our information from point A to point B. Now, last lecture we talked about the datagram and converting it to the transport layer and, and you know, with the, and, uh, the ethernet and everything like that. And what happens is what we're going to look at is this IP datagram, it has associated with an IP address, right? It is the IP address of that interface with that device, with the network, right? And then every device that's connected to this network has an IP address. If you have multiple, e like, you know, NICs, network interface cards on your computer, you're going to have multiple IP addresses associated with it. Now, the problem is, just like what I mentioned before, you can hard code IP addresses, but that would be problematic, right? Especially if you have something like a university-sized institution. If every one of you needs an IP address just for your laptop, and let's say you have multiple laptops, and then you have your phone, and then you have all these other devices and such, this becomes a big problem. So that's where I'll keep that. And do remind me if I go off topic. Uh, I have a lot of useless information I always love sharing. So. 
How many of you have been to Fall River? <coughs> what? Where is it? Fall. <laughs> Where? Okay, obviously not. So Fall River. Fall River was is located uh, right next to Rhode Island. For some time, it was actually part of Rhode Island. And then there was a border war, blah 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 blah, between Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, lots of manufacturing in terms of fabrics and, and and the like. And then it suddenly became. It was a one industry town, and then it kind of dissipated. And, they, and now it's kind of like serious. Like if you go there, just make sure you you don't carry law cash. So <laughs> just kidding. No, but it's a, it is a good town, so, you know. Now, what happens is this guy is what saves the day. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. So your laptops, your cell phones, your computers, even, even like, you know, WPI employees like myself. When I go and sit down at my desk, my computer is connected by DHCP. Now, here's the thing. So WPI verifies your device and whether it should connect to the network by what? It's MAC address, right? It's MAC, adre MAC address verification. There's also certificates, which sometimes and sometimes do not work, right? But what ends up happening is that at the end, this vital IP address is all dynamically allocated. Same thing with, let's say, cable modem or Fios. Well, I'm not sure about Fios. Definitely cable, you have to pay extra if you want a static IP address. But if, on the other hand, you're like, eh, whatever, I just care to stream movies down downloads and such, DHCP is fine, and then it refreshes, and there's a shelf life for that IP address, right? So what the way it works, so I laid out the steps here, is like, you know, host broadcasts. So that guy, your host, your phone. So host sounds very, very big. Could be your phone. Whatever sort of information device you have, right, could be your desktop, it will send out over the network. Once it connects, yo, I want an IP address. So it sends out the DHCP request. And then the DHCP server. So WPI has a DHCP server, perhaps in the basement of Fuller Labs with all those other servers. What happens is it will say, oh, OK, do you accept my offer? This almost sounds like deal or no deal. No, but what happens is it will say, OK, do you need an IP address? Here you go. Do you accept? And then host says, uh, you know, it says, OK, I, I'm, I'm going to request it formally. I'm going to go with this. And it says, acknowledge this is yours. And so what happens is that DHCP address, that will be allocated only to your information device. And then there's a shelf life. And usually it doesn't change uh, for the most part unless you disconnect your device and then reconnect it, you might get another one, depending on how many times people switch between connecting and not connecting to the network. But, but in essence, what happens is there's this sort of song and dance where your device talks with this DHCP server on this network to say, I need an IP address, and you are allocated one for the duration of your connection. Right? So it's really powerful stuff. It sure beats like the old-fashioned way. So when I was your ages, so you know, here's old man story now. Um, so when was that? 1996. Yeah, I think that's approximately how old you like. So yeah, like the old days, you know. So the internet was like, first of all, the our email clients were all text-based. It's like web web interface. We use something called um, what was it called? Mosaic. It's no longer in existence. I think Netscape was like the new thing. I, who here uses Netscape still? No, see? It's like, you know, many, many companies ago. So what happens is, in the old days, what happened is the poor system administrator, um, Yashik, that was his name. Yashik's the, I forgot his last name. Can't even pronounce it. But what happens is Yashik, he's like saying, oh, you have a computer? Oh, okay. Um, Hold on a minute. And then he'll take off, uh, take all this paper, and he'll say, I think 132, 168, 32, 24 is available. And it's like, oh my god. And he'll say, OK, what do you want to call your computer? Uh, how about call it uh, my email address when I was an undergrad was Alex Wig, because Alex W was taken. Mm. So it was like Alex Wig dot EE at the time. They changed it halfway through my, my undergraduate studies to ECE dot McGill dot CA. So that was my computer. But think about it. Like, imagine all of you had to go to help desk to get an IP address. 
wow, you know, they're good. I, don't, 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 don't say, uh, like, a help desk, like, I send something in 20 minutes, I get a response. Fantastic. But imagine thousands of people lining up, I need an IP address. So the DHCP server, in five seconds, approximately five seconds, when you connect to the network, you will have an IP address, and then away you go. You can go on Facebook and update your status, saying, I got an IP address. So, <laughs> so what happens is, when you connect, what information do you need? You need an IP address. You need a MAC address to your gateway. So your gateway is the first device that you connect to. Your device will connect to this first hop router. What do I mean? So the, like what I drew yesterday. Oh my god, so deja vu all over again. So what happens is, remember we, I drew this yesterday. You, and then let's say the network is this, right? And you want to connect, right? That's you. Actually, no, that's your device. You might look like this. OK. Now, what happens is you want to connect to the network. So what happens is the first router, so let's say that's a router. And you connect to him somehow. Like, you know, you're, so this guy, what we would term him, we would call him a gateway. And you'll see that if you ever do a setup of a network on your, on your device. This, uh, your gateway is the first guy you're going to connect to. My home, and we'll talk about NAT in a few minutes. My home is set up in a way where my router, right, the, the one that's connected then to the cable modem, is my gateway. <laughs> There's a small little computer, so it actually acts as a computing device, and, but it has the IP address 192.168.1.1. That's my gateway. That's also my DNS server, right? So, um, um, and so what, a domain name server, right? And so what happens is, like, we all connect to this, and then from here, he might connect to, do, if, depending on how big your network is, we'll connect with all these other servers and routers and stuff. Somewhere in this melee, there's going to be a DHCP server that your gateway is going to talk to. And what happens is when you first connect, what, what's going to happen is there'll be an interaction too. It will say, like, it'll say, I got a request. And it'll say, oh, okay, 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 okay. Let me send, here you go, here, you know, like, here's an offer. Okay, here's my official request. Okay, acknowledge, here's your uh, IP address, done deal. Now, that's why I didn't go into art, folks. So what happens is, The way it works is you need to have that MAC address at that gateway. There's also a DNS server in the mix somewhere. In my house, they're one and the same. And then what happens is your DHCP <coughs> request is framed. And how is it for, you know, to, but framed not in the criminal sense. It's like, like, he did it. What happens is the DHCP request is encapsulated, remember? So this is coming from the transport layer, right? So we encapsulate it in UDP, okay? Not TCP IP, UDP, right? So the difference between UDP and TCP, what is it? UDP, you fire off, and if it's lost, it's lost, right? And TCP is like, hey, um, did you get it? I'm going to resend, right? There's that, uh, there, is that rely there is that aspect of having a reliable transmission link, and if it's, if we don't get data across, then what we do is we retransmit. UDP doesn't have that. Now, once we have the transport layer, it goes down a layer to the top of the network access layer, and we encapsulate it as an IP datagram. So what happens is that UDP now is data that now we wrap to become an IP datagram. Then, from that, we encapsulate it into an Ethernet frame, right? And what's the Ethernet frame? That's the link layer. This is what I mean. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I love this diagram, so that's a keeper. But what happens is, as an aside, so here's transport layer, TL. This is network access layer. 
And that network access layer is divided. Ay. So first of all, you have your IP, right? You also have a link layer, right? So what happens is, so this stage, what do we have? UDP, right? Not TCP. Then it's packaged as an IP datagram. That IP datagram is now packaged as an Ethernet frame. And at each stage, we add more and more header information before we fire it off over the internet. Or the network, sorry. Internet's a little bit different. So what ends up happening is my DHCP request is there, gets packaged as a UDP, gets packaged as an IP datagram, and then gets packaged as an Ethernet frame. And then it goes down, down, down. And then ultimately goes out to the communication network. And then when that con confirmation comes back, the acknowledge, I begin pulling apart first the Ethernet frame to expose the IP datagram, then take the da IP datagram and pull it apart to give me the UDP packet. Then I pull that apart and I get the DHCP ACK and information that I so desire. <laughs> so, no, oh, presentation over. No, just kidding. It's not over. So what happens is we do this process, and this is the, the, the opposite, right? So get Ethernet, demult demultiplex means decode, means ripping off that packaging like Christmas Day. Of course, for my family, like, I don't know, I think I was kind of strange growing up. What happens is of my two sisters and I, for some reason, I always thought it was really important to save the wrapping paper. So when you know Christmas came along, instead of ripping it apart and shredding it, because I know a lot of people have fun. Even like uh, uh, last Christmas, like you know, my wife and I exchange gifts, and I think she just has great excitement. Like, <laughs> and with me, it's like, okay, peel off the tape very carefully. Don't rip everything, and you know, and save that paper for later on to re-gift it or something. So, anyways, so what happens is you get the Ethernet. It's demultiplex means that we m remove the Ethernet frame information, the header information to get the IP datagram. The IP datagram then is pulled apart to give me the UDB data. Then UDP is now decomposed to give you the DHCP information. Okay. And then the ACK is just saying, you're all set. And you have now an IP address. You have the IP address of that gateway. You have the IP address. So when you, when you get the ACK, you now have this guy's IP address. So now you know who to talk with. You have your own IP address. Now you're a legit element of that network, right? What else do you have? The name and the IP address of your DNS server, which depending on your network could be here. It could also be your gateway router. It could be anything. But, but you now have the access to it. You know who he is. And then you have that encapsulation process again. So at the end of the day, if any of you have set up your laptop manually, these guys should be very familiar, right? <coughs> so you have your IP address. And notice that in this case, guys, I actually, again, we're using that internal, like, you know, sort of the, the standard of like an internal network, which we'll look, look at in the next slide, the NAT, right? Um, so what happens is you have your IP address. Um, you have your gateway, your DNS is specified, and you have your subnet mask, which subnet you belong to. And, and I'm not sure what network is. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, that's kind of weird. But gateway is usually the guy that you talk to first when you connect to that network. All right? Okie dokie. So, so what happens is, so I've been talking a lot about, you know, home networks and stuff. So, what happens is the rationale. Why can't I have an IP address for my laptop that is unique um, and recognized to the outside world? And so is like, you know, maybe my Roku and maybe my wife's computer and my wife's iPhone and my LG G3 cell phone. Uh, it has its own IP address. Why do we need this thing of like an internal range of IP addresses? And the reason is like, to me, it's cheapness, right? If I go to Charter and I say, I want five IP addresses, they'll say, oh, OK, lots of IP addresses. That's a lot of money. 
Ooh, lots of IP addresses. Oh, this guy lives in like West Boylston. That's going to be a lot of money. And then, you know, and they say, oh, that's going to be $300, please. And I'm like, no, give me the one. Like, you know, seriously. Like, uh, you know, there, there are some situations where like, you know, uh, in, in the old days, and maybe this is just in Canada. So at my parents' house, again, another story. But in the old days, what happens is the cable company, if they found you have more than one device with an IP address at home, you know, so it was really difficult when I moved out of, out of my parents' house, you know, I told them, whenever the cable guy comes over, rip everything off of that router except for, let's say, the TV set, otherwise you're going to get caught, you know? And, so, and the first thing that comes out of their mo mouth is, what's a router, you know? So, so I'm like, ah, you know? Even to this day, it's like, uh, son, my laptop is not starting up. Did you plug it in? Yes, I did this time. And, you know, okay. Uh, did you press hard enough? Yes, I did. And, you know, did you uh, make the screen bright? Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, son. I don't know what we would have done without you. You know, so. And my little sister, I, you know, thank goodness she's there. Um, the bad thing is she is a microbiology expert. Like, she has a bachelor's and master's in it. But she tries to understand computers, right? So, anyways. So what happens is, nowadays, if let's say the charter guy or the Comcast guy or any guy comes over and he sees a router and a hundred devices connected to it, do you think, oh, well, okay, <laughs> hundred devices, that's going to be a lot of money. You know, no, 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 no. They're, they're not going to do anything like that. So what ends up happening is nowadays, like everybody has like multiple devices. On the other hand, I think if you have uh, more than one cable TV, I think there they, um, um, I think some, some cable companies still kind of restrict it. If you have like a second cable TV, you have to have a second decoder box, blah, 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 blah. Who watches cable anymore? Everything's streaming online, you know? So just have like, you know, one data plan, have over-the-air TV, and you're all set. Yeah, ask me. So what happens, so what happens is you have network ac address translation. So this is, the, this is the poor man's version of, you know, having lots of IP addresses but paying for the one, you know? And so the way this works is that you have the one IP address that the rest of the world sees, and then you have your internal network that can have lots and lots and lots of information devices connected to your router, but at the end of the day, someone's translating. The network address translation, what it does is, okay, um, this person here wants, like, you know, this computer here wants to stream Once Upon a Time, episode five, um, and I can assure you, I don't watch Once Upon a Time. And what happens is, okay, um, internally the IP address is 192.168.16. Okay, so what happens is that address hits the router and says, they're making a request to that server, I guess it's an ABC show? Yeah, ABC. So what ends up happening is, Blah, 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 it does its magic. And the magic it does is it says, OK, um, let's say in particular um, we have a host. Let's say this is my wife's laptop and she wants to watch Once Upon a Time. So she has this. It sends a datagram uh, to, instead of Google, port 80, it sends, it sends a di datagram to www.abc.com um, and then w whatever port it is to stream Once Upon a Time. Right, episode five. So what ends up happening is your router will convert uh, 192.168.1.123 colon 5555 to oops, careful <laughs> to um, whatever your your action like you know what your router's IP address the one IP address that controls them all at home 130. Point two one five dot eighteen dot eighty one um, colon five zero zero five. It sends a request, and then that streaming media goodness comes down to your router at that port, and then it gets converted back to whatever it is above there. The colon five 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 five. Ta da! At the same time, I might be watching yet another History Channel episode on. I'm not sure. Let me think like UFOs or airplane disasters or something. So I'll have a totally different port, a totally different internal IP address, but the same outgoing external IP address with a different port number. So that's how you can have 
one IP address to the entire world, but the translation based on what's after that colon will say, oh, that laptop, that laptop, that um, you know, t TV top uh, embedded device, like a Roku, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So this conversion with that little bit of information at the router, it will know who is requesting what and get the data to the right place. Because heaven forbid, my wife needs to watch another air disaster documentary, and I definitely don't want to watch Once Upon a Time. So, yeah, S S Sunday nights are really difficult at the Wuglinski family. Okay, so internet control messaging protocol. So this actually is pretty cool. This is actually when I can get hands-on experiment three handout ready, this is actually part of the third um, part of that handout. So there's no open-ended project. Aww. But, you know, well, I was thinking about it, like, you know, ask the class to make their own wireless networks and then bring them to school and get them jammed by WPI's networks. No, no, we're not going to do that. So what we're going to do is one thing I want to expose all of you to is ping, trace root, dig, and a few others. These are really cool tools. Um, because it gives you this sense like, I'm seeing the network. Especially Traceroute is my favorite. So Traceroute, you go from your computer, and let's say you choose something. So I was having fun with Tian Shang yesterday. So Tian Shang's getting some screen captures and helping out writing the, um, uh, the document, and, and so, so it's all ready for tomorrow. And what happens is I say, let's stalk my alma mater. Let's go to www.mcgill.ca and see what servers we go through and like, you know, see how long it takes to get information from WPI over to McGill and stuff. Whatever you do, I should turn off the mic, but whatever you do, <coughs> do oh, okay, it's still there. Don't, like, I, I would not recommend like trace routing or pinging like www.whitehouse.gov. Don't, don't do that. Don't, because th th they're probably like, oh, so there's this MAC address and IP address at this time being recorded from this computer here in Worcester, Massachusetts. And it's like, and then like, you know, if there's like 86 of you guys, <laughs> then they'll think it's more like, oh, cyber attack. You know, no, 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 don't do that. Cease fire, cease fire. So what happens is, um, do we have, do, no, we have remote desktop. And we, I'm not sure if we have putty or anything. Uh, okay. Sad. Okay, so w while we're doing this, what I'll do is, um, so, so one thing you can do, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, that what I would recommend doing is getting putty, <coughs> and I don't mean putty as in like uh, the material you put like around like windows and openings and walls and stuff, but I mean on the other hand, um, like this is an actual program, and what we can do is we can go to one of the Linux servers in the ECE network. So where's download, download, download? So choose a binary. Yeah, we can choose that one. Doop. Let's save. Ah. Open folder. So what we can do, like, you know, ping is really cool. And I'm just speaking, that's my personal opinion. So what you can do is you can run putty. So let's say you lo log into Tesla. That's such a cool name for a server, Tesla. Ah. I just don't know the institution PWI, but uh, so what ends up happening, so let's say port 22, I think that's correct. Yes. So let's say I log in as good old Alex W, boop, and my secret password, and it's not showing, so good it stays secret. So okay, so now I'm on Tesla, okay? And so I'm not sure if you guys can see. Yeah, it's, it's a bit dark. So let's, let's do that. A little bit better contrast. So like, you know, you, you, like these are all like the files and, and such. But what I'm kind of interested in is like several things. So ping, so ping is a really neat, uh, um, how can I say it, uh, utility. Because what ping will do is, uh, first of all, it's going, like, you know, let's say you ping, for instance, ece.wpi.edu. And what, uh, what this guy does, what ping does, is essentially it, it sends out a ping. Like this is kind of adopted from, like, you know, if any of you watch submarine films like Widowmaker or K-19 or like, you know, those things, like what do submarines do? Ping, ping, you know, it's like that sonar ping, right? It's like, you know, is anyone out there? Oh, yes it is. And from that time to target and back, you can say, oh, he's this far away. Okay, flood the torpedo tubes, let's get ready. So what this guy does, oh, 
No, it, turn, it gives us several information. Sometimes, first of all, ece.wpi.edu um, is an alias. So what it does is instead is, um, um, in this case, it's, it's by the server Maxwell. So if you ask Bob Brown to take you to the ECE server room, he'll point out Maxwell. He said, that's Maxwell. And then, and then it decodes, you know, what is the IP address of Maxwell? And it says, oh, it's 130.115.16.168. And then it tells you, like, you know, the ICMP sequence number, right? And, uh, and TTL, remember, it's like, um, it's, the, um, it's the amount, it's the lifespan of that, that packet, right? But what's interesting is this last guy. And this guy here tells you how much time it took in milliseconds to get from initiating ping to returning. And this is actually quite important. Because, like, for instance, if you want to test out um, between one server and another, would this be a problem if you want to communicate with, say, China, right? Or a place that doesn't have great internet connectivity. Or New Zealand, something very far away with lots of servers in a way, you can <coughs> estimate what the latency is going to be, right? So humans, if I'm not mistaken, um, I might be mix, mixing it up with microseconds. So um, humans, if I'm not mistaken, and I should double check, so I'll let you guys know. I think 20 milliseconds, um, that's the point where that amount of latency becomes really irritating. You know? So if, let's say in this case, OK, the latency is like 0 0.104, whatever it is, right? On average, you should average this out to get the average latency. That is, like if you do a Skype session with Maxwell, with a friend there, totally not going to bother. Well, remember, this is round trip time. So you need to cut that value in half, right? But what, what, what this tells you is that, um, so take that value, cut it in half. Remember, 20 milliseconds is the sort of borderline of latency before it gets really irritating to a human being. It becomes detectable. So totally, if you talk with someone by Skype to Maxwell from, let's say, this computer, no problem. It's going to be totally fine. Um, now, let's, let's, let's do some stalking. And um, ping www.mcgill.ca. OK. And what you see is now we got the 20.6, 20.5 millisecond latency. And that's only 350, um, 350 miles, I think. 350 miles away, so just north of Vermont. Vermont's a very small state. And so what happens is, but what happens is this is the round trip time, so you cut it in half. So it's about 10 milliseconds, still tolerable for latency-wise. Now, let's go nuts, and let's see if this is possible. Yes, I was about to do that. I was thinking, let's see if this works. It may or may not, so www. KingUniversity.ac.cn. So let's see China. This might be their address. No, unknown. So, let, uh, so let's say we find a New Zealand website. So how about my friend at Wellington University? NZ. Oh, Victoria University of Wellington. Okay, good enough for me. So, <laughs> so Victoria A C N Z. Okay, folks. So ping. Um, what was it? www? Yes, Victoria. Dot A C. Dot N Z. That's such a cool name. Oh. <laughs> I'm, uh, the thing is, maybe they, they don't allow pinging. So sometimes it might say host is unreachable, in which case one of two things, they either block the port and they don't allow pings, um, or it's just so far away that it won't do it. So this might, not, this might be a non-starter altogether. So you, know, you just have to, to um, if not that, so an alternative. What's a good alternative? I know, I'm just having fun. Um, let's try Nikta. Nikta Australia. Okay. So Nikta com AU. So let's say failing this, so this is just taking forever. That's silly. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's try, what was it? Nikta. So Nikta is kind of like their AU. There we go. So yeah, 214 milliseconds. So that's, that's a heck of a lot of latency. So you will 
obviously detect, you know, five times the detectable amount of latency that humans would tolerate uh, if you talk to the folks at NICTA. Moreover, it seems like, okay, so they have a web proxy server, so they, they're, you know, covering their tracks very nicely. Um, and, and you have the IP address assigned to it and, and such. But what, what, what Ping does is it's just a kind of a cute little tool to do things like, 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 you know, find out a little bit of information about how much latency from your computer it would take to, let's say, Skype over to, uh, say, um, um, in this case, Australia, which is not the most furthest part of the world away from us. So if you have any friends at the Australia Project Center, like, this is a great way of seeing how much latency is between you and them. All right. So that's a lot of fun. Um, so let's quit that. So, um, so ping is really useful. There's a few other tools like traceroute. Traceroute I've been having a little bit of difficulty on, on that server, so I'm still working that out. And then, of course, there's dig and a few others. And all of these tools, like what traceroute will give you, are all the hops. I was telling you about first hop and the gateway. What traceroute will do is say, OK, Who's connecting to the gateway after, and after that, and after that? So from point A to point B, if you say, OK, www.nicta.com.au, and I want to see between this computer and that server how many hops and who's in the way between here and there. And it's just crazy. You'll see every server, every step along the way that connects your information. All right, and, that, yeah, and port unreachable means Whatever. It just means that you can't connect to that guy. OK, so we're going to wrap up with um, IPv6. The big motivation, why are we changing IP addresses? And the answer is there's not enough addresses to go around. It's almost like, and I've noticed this a lot in Massachusetts, like this state seems to change the format of license plates like nobody's business. I've never seen that in any state. I thought Quebec, you know, my home province, um, change the license plates every 10 years. Here it's like, holy smokes, now it has a little dot in the middle. It used to be, um, what is it, two numbers, two letters, two numbers. Before that, it looked like it was like uh, two numbers, letter, space, um, letter, two numbers, and, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like, you know, it, it, the address has changed, and why is that? Well, because I'm guessing uh, either the state tries to jazz things up, or because you're running out of possible letter combinations for your addresses. I know in, in some places, like California, you have like, what, seven or eight letters, if I'm not mistaken, because everybody, it's car culture over there. They love the number of cars. Here, because everything is becoming connected, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your home heating system, your security system, your cell phone, webcams, everything's getting an IP address. The Internet of Things, right? you're going to quickly run out of IP addresses, right? All the combinations. <coughs> Even if you make lots of internal networks, right, and use NAT very heavily, you're going to start running out of all possible sort of naming conventions for these devices. So what you want to do instead is you make a really crazy IP address. So what you would do is instead of the 32-bit IPv4, that's what we're used to up until recently, what happens is instead, the IPv6 datagram format is like this. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, losing count, eight, four hex digit combinations. I mean, look at the possible combinations. But we need all of this. If you give an IP address, like have you noticed, I'm not sure if it actually has an IP address or not. Even the curtains, the automatic James Bond-like curtains that we have in this room that comes down, whoa, you know, Mr. Bond. No, but what happens is if you look at every one of these devices, there is like some Ethernet cable going into it and coming out of it. Like, so even like the automatic curtains are having an IP address. It's like, uh, Will Curtain 192.168.15, please lower. So. As a result, since we're running into that like, scarcity of IP addresses, they come up with this new format. So now what happens is, with this format, you have a priority that's identified with it, you have a flow label, and you have a header, right? And so at the end of the day, there are changes. First of all, there's a checksum that's removed entirely to reduce the processing time of your um, uh, IPv6 uh, address at each hop. You, you are allowed also to have like a next header field as well. 
And you also have a new version of ICMP, um, where you have things like packet too big, and you have, uh, you know, does not support the fragmentation and assembly like we saw before in, in lecture 19, right? And then finally, um, uh, you know, not all routers. Unfortunately, some routers, if it's old and somewhat deprecated, may not support IPv4, I mean IPv6, right? So there's going to be a point where you say, oh, darn, it's not compatible. Yes? I don't know. That's a great question. That, that, that's almost like, um, like nighttime reading of Wikipedia article type of question. I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll find, I'm, I'm kind of curious about two. And I wasn't quite aware about IPv1 to IPv3. My suspicion, I bet you they presented IPv5 as a proposal and was like, ah, that's not going to fly, and they didn't approve it. But let me double check. That's a good question. So I'm kind of curious about that, too. I will check that out tonight. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. why did you go to sleep? Oh, I want to find out about IPv5. Okay. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, so we looked at in today's lecture, we saw a lot. We had a great cool demo of ping. Now, I hope you all go pinging. But again, I'm not responsible <laughs> if you ping where you should not be pinging, okay? Don't, and if you do get, like, you know, law enforcement involved, you don't know me, okay? I don't <laughs> exist. Okay, with that, that concludes lecture 20. Because seriously, especially for...